In this video, the last one of all my videos on the periodic table, we'll have a look at some of the elements in group 13, 14 and 15. We find them here in the periodic table, and most often we just call them the boron group, the carbon group and the nitrogen group from the first element in each group. Let's start then with the elements in the boron group. First of all, there's boron, of course, with atomic number 5. It's a metalloid, which means it has some metal characteristics, but not all. The rest of the elements in the boron group, that is aluminum, or aluminium for our British viewers, gallium, indium, thallium and nihonium are metals. Then let's write this down, and you take this to your notes too, that the elements in group 13 have three valence electrons. Let's write the electron configuration for boron as an example. Boron has the atomic number 5, and thus 5 protons in its nucleus. Therefore, it gets 2 electrons in the K shell and the remaining 3 in the L shell. But I want you to learn something about the element boron too. It's a metalloid, which looks like this. It can be found in a mineral called borax, and it has the chemical formula Na2B4O7. Borax is used when making glass, and some ceramics and porcelain, and also as part of some abrasive detergents. Borax is also used to make boric acid, H3BO3. It is a weak acid that often is used in buffers that you need when working with DNA. And what weak acids and buffers are? Well, that's something you'll learn later in this course, when it's time to talk about acids and bases. Boric acid is also used in some flame retardants. Now, the next element here is a bit difficult, because I have to decide whether to say aluminium or aluminium. I think I'll stick with aluminium. Anyway, I suppose you're already quite familiar with this element. It has a lot of uses, for example in aircraft, aluminium pans or soda cans. Aluminium has so many uses because it's both light and very durable. And the reason why it's so durable is actually that it very rapidly reacts with the oxygen in the air. Then a very hard and airtight layer of aluminum oxide, Al2O3, is formed. This process is called passivation, since it makes the rest of the metal inert, unwilling to react with anything else, or passive. Another thing about aluminum is that it requires a lot of energy to produce from the mineral bauxite. Much less energy is required to recycle the aluminum by remelting it, so it is very important to recycle old soda cans. The third element in the boron group that I think you should learn something about is gallium, with the chemical symbol Ga. Gallium metal has a very low melting point, at least for being a metal. It melts already at 29.8 degrees centigrade. So if you hold a piece of gallium metal in your hand, it will melt. Anyway, gallium is used in particular in LEDs, light emitting diodes, to get white light. Now, let's look at the carbon group, which we find here. In the carbon group, it is extra obvious that the metal character increases as we move downwards in the group. You see, carbon up here is a non-metal, while silicon and germanium are metalloids, and tin, lead and fluorovium are metals. The atoms in the carbon group have four valence electrons, which give them extra interesting properties. Let's write the electron configuration for carbon as an example of that. There are six protons in the nucleus, and thus six electrons to distribute on the K and L shells. Two electrons in the K shell, and the remaining four in the L shell. Carbon, which is perhaps the most interesting element of all in the periodic table, exists in at least five different varieties. First and foremost, it is found in organic compounds like ethanol. This is thanks to the carbon atom's four valence electrons. Because of them, the carbon atom may bind to four other atoms, like, for example, carbon atoms, which in turn may bind to four other atoms, and so on. In this way, you can build fantastically complex molecules, exactly what you need to build a living organism. The organic carbon is here represented by an ethanol molecule, which consists of two carbon atoms that bind to each other, some white hydrogen atoms, and a red oxygen atom here too. The lead in your pencil is actually not lead, 
but a form of carbon called graphite. It consists of a large number of thin layers of carbon atoms like this. When you write with your pencil, the layers are scraped off onto the paper. You can also lead an electrical current through the layers in this direction, horizontally, but not in this direction, vertically. In a diamond, which consists of pure carbon, every carbon atom binds to another four carbon atoms in the way that is shown in this picture here. This makes the diamond incredibly hard, and it's also the reason why diamonds are transparent. Fullerenes were discovered in the mid-1980s. In one of its forms, it looks like a football. That's a soccer ball for you Americans. If you, so to speak, extend this football carbon, you get a long tube, a carbon nanotube, which you can see here. Finally, graphene consists of a single layer of carbon atoms in this way. As you can perhaps see, this looks like one of the layers that make up graphite. And it was also with the help of graphite that the first graphene was produced. It was the two researchers Konstantin Novoselov and Andrei Game who, with the help of normal adhesive tape, pulled off small flakes of graphene from graphite and transferred them to a transistor shown in the photo. For this discovery, they were awarded with a Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. Silicon, the next element in the carbon group, is a metalloid and the second most common element in the Earth's crust. Only oxygen is more common. The mineral quartz, which is a part of granite, which you see here to the right, is made of silicon dioxide SiO2. Otherwise, silicon is used in glass and in electronics, where the transistors are made of silicon. Tin is a metal that actually also exists in a non-metallic form. It has mostly been used in alloys with copper to make bronze, but also in tin casting to make tin soldiers and as protection from corrosion, tin cans. I'm also sure you've already heard about lead. It's a heavy metal that's also quite poisonous. In beautiful glass decanters like these, the glass contains considerable amounts of lead. The lead is said to give the wine a sweeter taste, but then it isn't very healthy to drink in large amounts. Which, of course, it isn't anyway, since it's alcohol. At any rate, in ancient Rome, they used containers of lead for their wine, and water pipes made of lead. This is because lead is quite soft and malleable, and also doesn't easily corrode. But the lead that dissolves in the water may give serious poisoning. The tradition with pipes made of lead still lives on in the English word plumber. Lead, in Latin, is plumbum, so a plumber is someone who works with lead. Today, lead is mostly used in ammunition and protection against radiation, for example in X-ray examinations. Now for the last of the groups in this video, that is the nitrogen group, or the pnictogens as they are also called. In this group, it's also evident that the metal character increases as we move downwards in the group. From nitrogen here, which is a gas, to phosphorus, which is a solid non-metal at room temperature, to arsenic and antimony, which are metalloids, and then finally bismuth and muscovium, which are metals. The nitrogen group is number 15, and in this group the elements have five valence electrons. If we study the electron configuration for nitrogen, we can see what that looks like. We have seven protons in the nucleus, which means we have seven electrons to distribute as well. Two in the K-shell and five in the L-shell. This means that at least nitrogen, phosphorus and arsenic can take up three electrons each and form nitride, phosphide and arsenide ions, with three negative charges. Nitrogen is by far the most common gas in our atmosphere, which consists of approximately 78% nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is inert, which means it is very stable and doesn't easily react with anything at all. At very high temperatures, like for example in lightning or combustions, it may, however, react with oxygen and form different forms of nitrogen oxides. Some bacteria may also fixate nitrogen directly from the air. Then, ammonia, NH3, is formed, which bacteria and plants may use to make DNA and proteins. In this model of a DNA molecule, every blue marble represents a nitrogen atom. 
so you can understand that quite a lot of nitrogen is needed for an organism to grow. Pure phosphorus, with the chemical symbol P, can exist in a few different forms. One of them is called white phosphorus, and in it the phosphorus atoms are joined together 4 by 4 in pyramids like this. White phosphorus is very reactive and may self-ignite. Red phosphorus is a type of phosphorus that is used to make the striking surface of matchboxes. In the head of the match there is potassium chlorate, and when it reacts with the phosphorus the match is ignited. When phosphorus reacts with oxygen, different kinds of phosphates form. A phosphate ion has the chemical formula PO43-. Phosphates are important for all living organisms, and why that is so, you can see once again in this model of DNA molecule. Every little yellow atom here is a phosphorus atom, and phosphates, together with a kind of sugar molecule called ribose, form the backbones of the DNA molecule. Arsenic, finally, is a metalloid that isn't only poisonous, it may be lethal. In some parts of the earth, people have been forced to drill very deep wells to get water. These deep wells reach arsenic-containing bedrock. This is a problem in, for example, Bangladesh, where you can get arsenic poisoning from drinking the water. So, now you've learned a little bit more about the periodic table and some of the elements in it. Don't forget that you can learn more and check your learning on my homepage. You'll find links in the description.